Welcome to Cinematic Excrement, part of this balanced breakfast. And today I am finally tackling a movie that I have wanted to tear into for a long time. It is one of the most laughably inept direct-to-video movies in recent memory, and was apparently directed by a rather vindictive asshat who thinks he is completely above reproach and prefers to silence criticism with takedown notices. And yes, there is a risk the same thing could happen to me, but I am not afraid. I will not be silenced by his tomfoolery! My voice will be heard whether he likes it or not. So without any further ado, let's take a look at Cool Cat Saves the <coughs> What? I... 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 Just... just how? how? How is this even possible? I'm still filming the damn thing! I haven't even uploaded anything yet! This motherfucker's got connections. And no respect for criticism. Well, shit, I guess we're just gonna have to go with plan B. Sure would be nice if I had a plan B, wouldn't it? Um, uh, what Hello? Sharknado 3? Ah, good old Sharknado. You never fail to disappoint me, mostly because my expectations for you are typically pretty low. The Z-Grade co-production from the Asylum and the Siffy channel became a Twitter darling back in 2013 and continues to shock and amaze with its third installment, Sharknado 3, Oh Hell No. And yes, that's really the title. I suppose it's slightly more creative than Sharknado 2, the second one, but it still feels slightly underwhelming. I would have gone with the Sharkening, but that's just me. This time around, Finn Shepard, played once again by Ian Ziering, finds himself in our nation's capital where he's presented with an award for saving New York in the last movie. Oh man, I want a golden chainsaw. I don't know what I'd do with it, but I want one. And if you've seen either of the first two movies, it should come as no surprise that Finn is surrounded by celebrity cameos, including President Mark Cuban. Get it? Because he's from Shark Tank. Waka Waka! Vice President Ann Coulter. And you thought the idea of Donald Trump in the White House was scary. And a few more random D-list people you probably don't care about. And Lou Ferrigno. Hulk takes selfie with guy from 90210. Hulk and big fan. Mark McGrath is also reprising his role as Finn's brother-in-law, although this is the only scene he's in for some reason. I guess Joe Dirt 2 just took up too much of his time. Writer cameo! Meanwhile, the rest of Finn's family are on vacation at... Universal Studios! <laughs> And here we find Finn's pregnant wife, April, played by Tara Reid, her mother, May, played by Bo Derek. Yes, April and May, very clever. Her daughter, Claudia, played this time by Ryan Newman, and their son, Matt, played by Sir not appearing in this film. Already I have a question. Why is Finn's family in Florida instead of being with him in D.C.? You'd think they'd want to be there when he received an award from the freaking president. Were they just not invited to the award ceremony? And if that's the case, dick move, President Cuban. Dick move. But it turns out leaving his family in Florida may have been a good idea after all, as Finn feels a Sharknado coming on. I know how this is gonna sound, but I can sense these storms now. Yep, that sounds ridiculous. But for these movies, that's par for the course. Ridiculous or not, he's right, and the Sharknado soon hits the White House. I guess the Sharks are Democrats. Lou Ferrigno, no! So it's time for Finn and the president to take up arms and shoot them some sharks. Unfortunately, this action sequence is kind of boring for the most part. It's very reminiscent of the Boondock Saints 2 where the heroes just stand there and shoot stuff. It's a little bit sillier because, you know, sharks, but I still think they could have done better, even with the low budget. Let's do this! Wow, they're dead already? Oh wait, never mind. They're still alive somehow. And this is the point where the movie becomes a bit of a mess. Finn makes his way down to Florida to meet up with his family, naturally battling sharks on the way, and his family just kinda chills at Universal Studios, occasionally running away from sharks, and just waits for him to show up. And that's all they do, really. It's pretty much the same problem the second movie had. Finn is off having an adventure with half the cast, and the other half doesn't really have much to do. This entire Universal Studios story feels like half shameless product placement and half pointless filler to bring the runtime to 90 minutes. 
You'd think they would have learned from the last movie's mistakes, but instead they seem to have doubled down. And of course, we have more celebrity cameos. Some of them are kind of fun, like Chris Jericho, George R.R. R. Martin, Jerry Springer, and Michael Winslow. They also brought back the cast of the Today Show, who are once again playing this completely straight, which is awesome. But then you have Michelle Bachman. Why? I mean, her acting isn't especially bad or anything, but of all people, why her? If you can't get anybody cool to do a cameo, there's nothing wrong with simply not doing a cameo scene. Anyway, while Finn is driving to Florida, because all the planes have been grounded, he's suddenly accosted by another Sharknado, even though the skies were obviously clear just before it hit. And how was he surprised by that Sharknado? I thought he could sense these things now or some such bullshit. But he gets some help from an old friend, Nova, played by Cassie Scarbo, and her sidekick, Frankie Muniz, who stops the Sharknado by blowing it up or freezing it or however the fuck it works now. Pretty soon, I expect they'll start taking these things out by magic. Like they'll literally start casting spells and shit. Sharknado Patronum! I, uh... I don't have a magic wand. While it's nice to see Nova again, I'm a bit puzzled by the scratch on her face. I swear it keeps changing as the movie goes on. It's always in about the same place, except for this one moment where they inverted the shot, but the size and angle changes. I'm not even sure why the scratch is there in the first place. The first time we see her, she's wearing a mask, and when she takes it off, the scratch is already there. How did it get there? Why did they feel the need to put the scratch on her face? Does it really add that much to the character? And eventually it just disappears. Where did it go? Is this really what it's come to? I'm nitpicking a scratch on someone's face. What am I doing with my life? <sighs> well, back to the movie. Nova and Frankie, his character has a name, but screw it, I'm just gonna call him Frankie, are apparently traveling the country taking on Sharknados in their shoddily armored RV, which looks like something from the poor man's Mad Max. And considering the Asylum made this movie, I would not be surprised if they recycled that for a Mad Max mockbuster. I wonder what they would call it. Insane Ivan? Demented Damien? Maybe Ludicrous Larry? Oh, 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 Unhinged Umberto! Nah, that's too much. By the way, if you're wondering how Nova just happened to run into Finn, the movie does offer an explanation. She has a tracking app that shows Finn's location at all times. That's not creepy at all. But as weird as Nova's stalker behavior is, the weirder thing is Finn is totally cool with it. He doesn't so much as bat an eyelash. You know where I'm at at all times? Friends are supposed to look out for each other, right? Sounds legit. On their way south, they stop in an Air Force base in Charleston, and wow, they made it from DC to Charleston already? That's like an eight hour drive. How fast does that RV go? Anyway, Finn just happens to know the base's commanding officer, how goddamn convenient, and he happily lets Finn and Nova borrow a freaking jet. Handing out fighter jets to civilians doesn't seem like the most logical thing to do, or the most legal. And I find it a bit disconcerting that a couple of random civilians appear to have all the answers, but the entire United States military is completely helpless. That does not bode well. Especially since, according to Frankie, the Sharknados are about to merge into one big super shitstorm. Merging Sharknados? Shark again. Can there be such a thing? Um, yeah, it happened in the first movie. Where have you been? So while Finn and Nova take to the air, another Sharknado appears and Frankie tries to take it out. But he loses a leg for his trouble. And an arm. And the other leg. Okay, enough already. Just a flesh wound. But somehow Frankie manages to hit the big red button and blows those sharks right the fuck up. Thanks for coming, Frankie. And Finn and Nova crash land in a river in Florida and... swim to the surface in their underwear. Oh... Okay. Not sure what to say to that. They make it to Universal Studios and Finn is finally reunited with April, but through a wacky turn of events, he ends up trapped on a runaway roller coaster. Well, he's dead. Right? Are you fucking kidding me? No one could have survived that. And not only did he survive, he doesn't have a scratch on him. 
I know these movies are not exactly supposed to be realistic, but there's only so far you can push that. So Penn and Teller and David Hasselhoff walk into a bar. It turns out the only way to stop these pesky Sharknados is by going into space. I'd explain why, but A, it makes no sense, and B, do you care? And while Finn can easily borrow a fighter jet at a moment's notice, borrowing a space shuttle is a little tricky even for him. Fortunately, his father just happens to be an astronaut. And he's also David Hasselhoff, so bonus. Director cameo! But just before the shuttle can launch Finn and the Hoff into space, April, being an idiot, tries to stop Finn from getting on board. And a shark just happens to take out the platform right then, so there's no choice but to bring her into space with them. How fortunate that they just happen to have a spare maternity-sized spacesuit lying around. I really don't know why they wanted her on that shuttle. It'd be one thing if she actually did something, but she doesn't. In fact, that's sadly the case for the entire movie. It feels like she's only here because, well, she was in the first two movies, so she has to be here. Her role is entirely superfluous. And she wasn't even there when Ziering and Hasselhoff filmed the space shuttle sequence. They filmed her part separately and hoped no one would notice. But why film it at all when it's so pointless? Anyway, once they're in space, the Hoff fires up a satellite with a freaking laser beam. Oh yeah, they have one of those. Just go with it. And they easily take out all of the Sharknados, or Sharkicane, or whatever. But it has the side effect of launching several of the sharks into space! So Finn has to take them out with his chainsaw lightsaber. Yeah, they have one of those too. Because of course they do. How can they survive in space? That is a very good question. How can they survive in space? Guess they got me there. Long story short, Finn and April both get swallowed by sharks, which somehow allows them to fall safely back to Earth, because if you haven't noticed by now, the main characters are invincible. And I guess April gave birth in mid-descent. Why not? And with one final salute to the Hoff, who is now stranded on the moon, our story comes to an end. Or does it? Yep, the movie ends on a cliffhanger. And when this aired on TV, the Siffy channel asked fans to vote on Twitter whether April lives or dies. I personally think this is kind of dumb. For one thing, if falling from space to Earth inside the belly of a shark doesn't kill her, what will? And even if the fans vote for her to die, you know they're gonna put her in the movie anyway. They'll just bring her back as a zombie or a cyborg or possibly a zombie cyborg. Come on, it's the Asylum. Would you really put it past them? Anyway, that's Sharknado 3. How do I sum this up? Chris Jericho dies, Lou Ferrigno dies, David Hasselhoff left to die, and Coulter lives. Minus five stars! Nah, I'm just kidding. This was still kind of fun. It has its problems, of course. The effects still look like crap, though they have improved with each movie. The story is pretty anemic and makes no goddamn sense, and Tara Reid's acting is still not great. But it was silly enough to keep me entertained, and really, that's all I can ask for. But I have to wonder how much life is left in this franchise. I mean, think about it. Each movie is basically telling the exact same joke, and I can't be the only one who thinks it's starting to wear a bit thin. And where, pray tell, could they possibly go from here? They've already been to outer fucking space. What else is there to do? I'm sure the next movie will still have an audience, and you know I'll be watching right along with them, but I think Sharknado 4 needs to be the finale. Otherwise, the franchise runs the risk of wearing out its welcome. Learn from Paranormal Activity's mistakes, Sharknado. And while you're at it, learn from your own. Well, next time we're going back to the wonderful world of superheroes. But until then, I am the Smeghead, and Hollywood can suck it. Could be worse. Could be zombies. <laughs>